Good evening, everyone. Uh, last week, we gave, uh, I guess, the geographical background to Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato. We spoke about the uh, Italian Jewish community, the unique Italian Jewish community. We spoke about uh, the history of the Jews in Italy from uh, the Roman period and slightly before, all the way up until Second World War and even in present day. Uh, still a vibrant community, although quite small. And uh, we spoke about some of the great sages who lived in Italy and some of the great works that came from Italy. And, uh, uh, and Italy has a, a certain unique character of the Italian Jews that is expressed, as I said, in their own unique nusach, that is to say their form of prayer, which is not Ashkenaz and it's not Sfard. It's not the, the North African Middle Eastern Jewish custom. It's not the Ashkenaz European Jewish custom. They have their own unique custom, Nusach, Romi, the Roman custom. I was speaking to Rabbi Rieti, a good friend of mine this week, who uh, is of Italian origin. His father is from Italy. And uh, he says, yes, he has the Italian Sidurim, Italian Marzorim. They're not in, that's the Italian Nusach. Interesting, one of the great Kabbalists, actually a student of Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato, commented that he says, you know, there are different attributes, divine uh, attributes called sefirot. They are what you might call modalities of, of divine will. And uh, there's the right side, there's, they're divided into a type of a diagram. You've got right side, left side, and the middle. The right side generally tends to be the side of kindness and chesed, giving, loving kindness, etc. And the left side is the side of, of uh, gvura, power, din, justice, etc. And the middle is the ideal harmony of those two sides. So it's interesting, Rav Moshe Vali, who was a student of Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato, he pointed out, he says, the Ashkenazim, the Jews of Europe, he says, are from the left side of the chart. There's a certain uh, sharpness and a certain strength in their style of learning. There's like a very, you know, people, it's clashing. When you, when you hear Ashkenazi rabbis, European rabbis of European origin studying, they're arguing with each other. There's, there's, there's a back and forth, really like, really intense. It's, it's fiery, etc. The way they act, he says it's gvura. It's power, judgment, it's the left side of the, left side of the chart. He says the Sfardim, the Jews of the Middle East, North Africa, their style of Torah study is quite different. It's much more harmonious. There's much less of the, of the, of the harsh clash. There's much less of, the, of the, the incisive sharpness, but there's much more broadness. It's much broader. There's much greater uh, harmonization of sources, etc., uh, for example, if you look in the responsa, responsa, when rabbis respond to questions that people ask, things that are not explicit, uh, situations that arise that are not explicit, and a rabbi gives a response. So two of the greatest rabbis of our century, one of them, Rav Moshe Feinstein of blessed memory, and the other, uh, should live long, is Rav Avadu Yosef. And they both represent very different... Rav Moshe Feinstein, when he gives an answer to a question, he goes straight back to the Talmud. He rarely quotes anyone from Talmud to our time. Talmud was 2,000 years ago. And he uses his, his sharp logic, his in-depth understanding to come out with a... from the precedence and the logic of the Talmud to come out with an answer to your question. Rav Avadji Yosef, who's a, a walking encyclopedia... Totally different. You ask a question, he will now give you every source ever written about it. Ever. Throughout history. And will show you what's the consensus, who's the majority, and this is what you should do. So, again, there's the... So, so Moshe Vali says those represent two different styles within Judaism. Traditional Orthodox Judaism, but two different styles. He says the Italians, he says, they're, they're the harmonious connect between Ashkenaz, the Europeans, and Sfard, the Jews of the Middle East. He says they are what's called Tiferet, which means glory, and that's the, it's the combination, interestingly enough, of the left and the right-hand side. 
Fascinating. It's interesting. He was Italian, so he was slightly prejudiced. But that's how. That's what he says. I actually, I actually told this. Uh, I, I, I spoke at Rabbi Rietti's son's bar mitzvah. So since they're of Italian origin, I, I started with this idea. He was very happy about it, right? And, but but that's that's a little bit of the just the Kabbalistic perspective on the Italians. Now, now we come to the life of Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato, born in 1707 in the ghetto of Padua in Italy. And uh, we don't know the birthday, as I mentioned in previous classes. We generally don't know birthdays of many of these great people because when they were born, they weren't great. So uh, history did not record for posterity when they were born because like, he wasn't Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato when he was born. He was his, 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 his parents. And, oh, he's a cute little guy. Well, so it's not known to posterity. Okay. Um, but anyway, just to, before we actually start on his life, he's born in 1707. And certain events really shaped a tremendous amount of his life and what he went through was shaped by events that took place in the 17th century, in the 1600s. In the 1600s, I'm sure you're, you're all aware of this, that during, in the, in the 1600s, uh, the first major event uh, in Jewish history at that period was what we call the Chelmanitsky pogroms. A Cossack... Russian Orthodox Cossack by the name of Bogdan Chelmanitsky uh, led a peasant revolt against the Polish overlords. And it's a long and complex story. There are, there are, you know, I think it could be argued that he had a certainly a good case against these Polish overlords. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Jews were worked for, were allied with these Polish lords. And uh, aside, from number one, number two, uh, Chelmyski is a Russian Orthodox uh, Christian, so there was a lot of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church for centuries has preached anti-Semitism, continues to do so, I should point out, uh, in Russia. And uh, so combined with the, the political affiliation and economic uh, situation of the Jews and combined with the religious anti-Semitism, there were horrific, horrific massacres that took place under Bogdan Chelmanitsky. Tens of thousands of Jews were massacred. People in the most horrific ways, I won't describe it, but the most horrific, we have eyewitness accounts of what went on, and they spared no one, men, women, children, the, old, the elderly, babies, pregnant women, just horrific stuff that went on. Uh, uh, torture, rape, mass murder, and they destroyed Jewish communities through huge swathes of uh, Ukraine and Poland. And there were thousands of Jews who went as refugees to, uh, to other places, to Turkey, for example, um, was a place where many Jewish refugees went. So that was the, that was the horrific event. In the, there's a, uh, a family living in Turkey, in Izmir, and the father is a fairly well-to-do merchant. He started off in the poultry business and um, he was uh, expanded into groceries in general. He's a wealthy Jew in Izmir, Turkey. Turkey had a huge Jewish population, very important and large Jewish population. This man's name, <clears throat> this man, they had a child born on Shabbat, and hence they gave him the name. Lots of, often children who are born on the Sabbath, traditionally they're given the name Shabtai. Shabtai means he of Sabbath. So the family, the Tzvi family, had a son Shabtai, and he was born about 16 years before the, Sh the Chelmanitsky pogroms took place. Um, he had, he, he, uh, had a good education, two older brothers. He had a good education. He was uh, bright. He was bright, very charismatic, very good looking. Uh, and he was, also had, he was also manic depressive. They didn't know how to diagnose that then. But he had, he had times where he was, people would say he was, he was just full of unbelievable energy, which they interpreted as something spiritual, as some, as some divine blessing. And they say his face shone, his eyes were fiery, etc. And of course he had times of deep depression. Uh, his name is And uh, by, around, when he starts to hear word, of what happened in the Khmernitsky pogroms, he decides that he is 
someone's got to do it. There has to be vengeance for the blood of these innocents that has been killed. There has to be divine judgment. Something's got to happen. What's, how could this be? And he felt, I guess in his moments of being manic as opposed to depressive, that, that he, he felt that, that destiny had... He's, he had to play some pivotal role in this. And uh, people gathered around him. There were people who, who, who just were attracted to him and, um, and were very impressed by him. He had some weird things, did some weird things, but people were attracted to him. Anyway, as he grew older, he realized that something was wrong. He realized that something was wrong. And he went, he traveled to Israel. He had problems in the community. He did some very strange things. As you can imagine, manic depressive. He's very bright. He's a teenager. He has these ideas that he has to do something great in this world. So he had run-ins with the community. He goes to Israel. There's a guy in Israel, in Gaza. There was a large Jewish community in Gaza. Uh, and uh, in Gaza, there's a fellow by the name of Nathan Ashkenazi, Natan Ashkenazi of Gaza. Brilliant, brilliant scholar. Much more brilliant than Shabtai Tzvi. A great Kabbalist a great scholar, a great writer, a great orator, and he was also known to be a man who was able to heal people and help people who had psychological and other problems. Shabtai Svi goes to him to help him, he, to, to hopefully maybe he can cure his, his manic depression. So he goes to Nathan of Gaza. Nathan of Gaza sees an opportunity here. Instead of curing him, he explains that Kabbalistically he says when you have this depression that's because during your manic phase you've been fighting with the forces of, of negativity, with impurity. He says when, they, when, they, when, they, when you're in the middle of the fight it's depressing. He says you're in the darkness. But when you've succeeded that's when, you are, that's when you're elevated. And he convinced him that he was the Messiah. In other words, Shabtai Sfi didn't think of him. He knew he could play some pivotal role. He, he, had, he had delusions of grandeur. Uh, uh, not completely unjustified. He was a charismatic, special person. But he goes to this guy to cure him, and instead Nathan of Gaza sees an opportunity here. And Nathan of Gaza builds him up as the Messiah. So this is in 1660, 1665, approximately. And he, he now... People gather around Shabtai Tzvi. He goes back to Turkey. He travels around. He is supported financially by his brothers, who are wealthy. And he really uh, uh, he has a huge impact on the Jewish community in Turkey. His fame spreads around the world. Uh, Nathan of Gaza writes numerous letters. Nathan of Gaza, of course, proclaims himself to be allied to the prophet and who heralds the Messiah. He writes letters, eloquent letters, letters embellished with Torah, with, with Kabbalah, mysticism, etc. Very impressive stuff. And between the two of them, they really create a revolution. And it's interesting, so many pe the, the, the um, people who believed in Shabtai Tzvi as the Messiah were known as the Ma'aminim, the believers. Anyone who denied him was called a kofer, a heretic. There were rabbis initially who were skeptical and who were against him. But some of them who spoke out against him got uh, beaten by mobs, threatened with death, threatened with violence, thrown out of their post. Shabtai Svi himself in the synagogue in Izmir where the rabbi was opposed to him, he came on Shabbat with a crowd with axes they broke down the doors with axes, came in there and opened up the ark and declared him, I mean, uh, uh, said, had the whole community say the name of God that we never pronounce except in the temple. All types of strange stuff I won't go through. This is not a class about Shabtai Sfi, but I want to give you the background to explain. It explains a lot about uh, Ramosha Chaim Lozato's life. Shabtai Sfi, of course, there were some positive sides to it. The fact is, in the Jewish world, people were repenting right and left. People were, were, their prayers were more sincere, they were giving more charity, people were treating each other wonderfully, people were going to shul regularly, people were learning Torah, people were saying Psalms, people were doing less business, more, it was unbelievable. There was a, you know, in other words, so if you're a rabbi who's skeptical, what are you going to say to your community? Stop with the religion, take it easy, this guy's not the Messiah, is that what you're going to do? Very, very difficult. 
there's a, there's a responder of a rabbi then. Someone asked him that he had some unknown witnesses who signed on a divorce. And he says he doesn't know who the, the he doesn't know who these witnesses were. He wants to know, you know, he's discussing are they kosher witnesses? Are they observant, etc. etc. So the rabbi writes, if these witnesses, if this get, this divorce was signed after the pronouncement of Shabtai Tzvi as Messiah, you can assume that the witnesses are kosher witnesses. Because certainly at this point, but just about everyone has done shuva. An English businessman in, uh, writes that, that, that the, the economic, the world, world economy was affected by this. Jews of Amsterdam rented every single ship they could find in Amsterdam, in the harbour there, and they, they were not available to take, uh, to take uh, do trade with, uh, from America. It was not available. There were businessmen who complained that the Jews have stopped doing business, there's no loans going on, what's going on? The, the world economy was affected by this. The Jewish world was affected by this. So, of course, as you, as you know, through a long series of events, Shabtai Sfi is found to be... Uh, he, he, is, he is offered the choice of death or conversion to Islam, and he decides to convert to Islam. He's put into a prison. Uh, he's still, people still flock to see him. Uh, but, of course... For the majority of Jews, once he converted to Islam, and I should point out, even after he converted to Islam, people still believe that he was the Messiah. To this day, there are people who still follow Shabtai Tzvi. They're known as the Donmeh. They live in Turkey. In fact, it is the, 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 in Turkey, it's, very, uh, it's a very common uh, thing to blame the Donmeh for all the woes of Turkey. Uh, some say that Kemal Ataturk, who created modern secular Turkey, which is now turning back to, to, to medieval Islamic Turkey, uh, was actually a Donmeh, a Jew who was a secret messianic a believer in Shabtai Sfi. I mean, it's unbelievable stuff. There's communities of Donmeh still in Greece and in Turkey. So, but, but for the majority of Jews, when he becomes a Muslim, it's over. So as you can imagine, what happened? The Jewish world, mass depression. People committed suicide. There were people who converted to Christianity. There were people who converted to Islam. There were people, according to some historians, this was the beginning of, the, of, the, of, of such a thing as a secular Jew. Until that time, there'd be no such thing. There were Jews who were Jews, and you kept religion, and there were Jews who were apostates. Christians, Muslims, but that's it. There's no such, nothing else. At the time of, uh, uh, from Shabtai Sfi, you started to get people who were identifying as, as Jewish, but forget religion, secular Jews. So, and, and so suicides, conversions, and as you can imagine, a lot of Jews were saying to their neighbours, their non-Jewish neighbours, just wait, Messiah is going to come any day now, he's going to take us to Israel, you guys will get, your, will get what you deserve and what happens. As you can imagine, uh, so Jews are walking along the street, there's, there's, I have a book which I got a reprint of a small pamphlet written by, it's written by an important Englishman in Izmir. At the time, and it's written. In, it's actually still written in the old English with the big, you know, the S that looks like an F. The F looks like an S. But the whole thing. And he writes how he would see children, Muslim children, in the streets when a Jew would walk by. They'd start yelling at them, Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. That's it. So how? And this, and this was, by the way, not just the Jews in Turkey. There were Jews in Poland. There were Jews in Russia. Jews in Italy. Jews all over the world who believed in Shabtai Tzvi. And now. So you're following on, you've got the, the Chalmanitsky pogroms, horrific battles, horrific wars, horrific torture, etc. You've got Shabtai Tzvi and the huge, I mean disappointment is not a strong enough word, I don't know what to call it, but this huge disappointment. And now, um, now you've got the rise of the Hasidic movement in Podolia, in, in, the, in uh, Eastern Europe. And now, 1707, here's a boy... So now, now, that's the background. Oh, and as, as you can imagine, there were rabbis who took it upon themselves right after this whole Shabtai Tzvi debacle that anyone, anyone who smelled of Shabtai Sabbateanism is what we call it historically, anyone who, if there was a slightest hint of Sabbateanism, they'd come down to this person like a ton of bricks. Are they right? Of course, 100%. And there were rabbis who's, who, who made it their business to do this. So, so to, to, and there was a huge controversy, the, the emden Ibershutz controversy, um, between two of the greatest rabbis in Europe, who lived, by the way, around the corner from each other, never spoke to each other. And, and a huge con because one accused the other of being a Sabbatean. Being a Sabbatean. And this was the accusation thrown around. Into this, into this world comes Ramchal, Ramosha Chaim Lozato. 
Um, I'll call him Ramchal. It's the Hebrew abbreviation of his name. It's just easier than saying Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato every time. So the Ramchal was born to Jacob, Vita, Yaakov Chai, and Diamante Lozato. Good Italian Jewish names. Lozato. And he attended the Yeshiva of Padua. And in 1724, there was a group of teenagers called Mavakshe Hashem. What does that mean? Seekers of God. They were teenagers who were inspired. They spent their time studying Torah, praying, and these were uh, unbelievable. And they spent all their time doing this. So it's a group of, eventually he becomes one of the, the leader of the group. He is the most brilliant of them all. He's the most inspired of them all. He's the most, he understands more than all of them. And he's, uh, he's, he's very charismatic. He becomes a leader. In, when he's 19 years old, he already receives his rabbinic ordination. And 1729, 22 years old, he has a, a prophecy. He has revelation. He has what, what he called a magid. A magid means someone who tells. Haggadah on Pesach. What's Haggadah? It means the telling over. Magid means an angel or divine inspiration that informs you of ideas. Not, not a future, not, not a prophecy in terms of future, but it gives you an understanding of things. There are a few famous figures who had a Magid. The most famous figure who claimed to have a Magid, an angel, who communicated with him was no other than Rabbi Yosef Karo, author of the Code of Jewish Law, who was not only a great legal scholar, he was a great mystic as well. And, he had, and we actually have a book called Magid Mesharim, the, the, uh, the just for the, the, the upright uh, Magid, in which he has all the stuff that he, that he was inspired to hear, but from this angel, from this divine source, that he writes down. So we have the book still. So he doesn't tell anyone. He doesn't tell anyone this. The, the Ramchal does not spread this. He just records things, and he suddenly, people start hearing amazing things from him. I'm not talking about prophecies. I'm not, I'm not talking about stuff about, oh, your uncle and stuff. No. I mean, uh, insights into the Torah. Clarity into the Torah. Uh, inspiration of the Torah. Unbelievable stuff. 22-year-old kid. And people gather around him. So now, you can imagine what rabbis in the area are thinking. What are the rabbis thinking? Another exactly. He's young. He's handsome. He's eloquent. He is charismatic. He is brilliant. He inspires people. He's delving into Kabbalah. Mysticism. Right? There are rumors that he has some type of divine inspiration. So they persecuted him. They persecuted him to the ends of the earth. For nine years, Rabbi Moshe Chagiz, who was a great rabbi, great rabbi, uh, he was in Altona, one of the great... Um, one of the great communities in Germany. There were three great communities in Germany known as Al Ahu. Anyone heard of Altona, Hamburg, and Würzburg? These were the three greatest communities in Germany. The rabbi of these communities was one, a very powerful person. And Rav uh, Moshe Chagiz was on the court in Altona. Uh, the rabbinical court of Hamburg, uh, whose chief rabbi was um, Ezekiel Katzenellenbogen. They heard about this young man in Italy, and they said, if we don't stamp this out, we're going to have another horrific tragedy like we just had. So they forbade him from teaching Kabbalah. They tried to they excommunicate him, etc., etc. People heard it. There were lots of people hearing about him. So one of the great rabbis asked, does he, does he trim his beard? Does he trim his beard? Does he go to the mikveh every day? And the answer to it was, Yes, he trims his beard. No, he does not go to the mikvah every day. That made it even worse. Not only is it, he's, if he's such a great Kabbalist, why isn't he going to the mikvah every day, which is a custom of the great Kabbalists? He trims his beard? But of course, from the perspective of the Ramchal, uh, true piety is not manifested in things like whether you trim or grow your beard. It's not manifested in going to the mikvah every day. It's manifested in a complete personality. But they, didn't, they were not aware of that. They're only aware of what's happening in his uh, externally. So he went through ter terrible persecution. He was forced to sign an agreement not to write any Kabbalah. Not to write anything. And his teacher, 
His teacher actually um, told him, Rav Bassan was his teacher, he advised him to sign the agreement. He says, otherwise, they'll drive you to your death. So he signed the agreement. Later on, in a letter, he writes that he ignored it because he said an agreement signed under coercion is not an agreement. But he had to sign this publicly. Um, the works that he had written, by 1730, he'd already written quite a few books. He's only 23, but he'd already written quite a few books. And his works had to be given over to Rav Moshe Chagiz, sealed in a box, the key given to Rav Moshe Chagiz, the box buried. So he's still teaching, he's still writing, he's still inspiring people, but as you can imagine, it's not easy. He starts a group called the Chabura HaKedosha, the holy group. And that has special rules, special laws. They have to study a certain amount of time per day, they have to pray a certain amount, of, they have to maintain a level of purity, ethical, spiritual purity, and, and people, people flock to this. One of the great uh, followers of this group, it's interesting, I, I mentioned last week that the, the medical school in Padua, the University of Padua was one of the only schools to actually accept Jews. Uh, in the United States, until the 1950s, uh, universities still had quotas of how many Jews they'd accept, especially medical schools. So, anyway, he, um, uh, he, there was a, a Jew from, from Poland by the name of Yukutiel Gordon, who had come from Poland to Italy to study medicine in Padua. I do not know if he ever graduated, because he became the prime student of, of the Ramchal. And a lot of information we have comes from Yukutiel Gordon, who became... But he gathered people flocked to him. This guy's in medical school, but he was going to the Ramchal's classes in Kabbalah, in Judaism, in, in, in the Torah, and this was the uh, Chabarak Dosha. Due to further persecution, he was not able to stay in his native Italy, and in 1735, he left Italy for Holland. Holland was a much more liberal place, even today, Holland's very liberal. You know, uh, so, but even then, it was much more liberal and uh, open, and he had to move to Holland, not because he had any great love for Holland, but uh, he was being persecuted in his homeland in Italy. So uh, on his way, unfortunately, on his way to Holland, he stopped in Frankfurt. There, the court, Jewish court got hold of him and forced him to sign another agreement that he would no longer, he would not teach Kabbalah at all. Not just not write it down, but he wouldn't even teach it. So he's forced to sign another agreement. Um, unfortunately, also, uh, he had sent... Uh, he had sent a lot of his stuff. Uh, I don't know how they used to send stuff, but I, you know, not U-Haul or whatever it was. But but uh, the, the the he sent stuff, and it went um, uh, guaranteed overnight delivery or whatever. Um, I tell you, I was I was giving a class in in Manhattan once to a group of students from California. We were at a hotel, the Carlton Hotel, and I'm sitting the back is the 30, I think it was, um, must have been 28th or something street, if I remember correctly. And there's a glass wall behind me. I'm giving like, the students sitting here, the street's behind me. I'm talking, I, I say, God's presence permeates all of time and place continuously. And as I'm saying this, the students are like, oh. because right behind me, as I'm saying this, this truck pulls up, huge letters, God. <laughs> which stands for if you're from New York you know that stands for guaranteed overnight delivery if you are a student from California and Rabbi Becher talks about God permeating all of time and place and then his truck pulls up <laughs> it blew them away I'm, I'm just like I'm saying wow I, mean, I didn't realize what I said was so powerful but they're like they're like Rabbi Rabbi and I look around they're unbelievable anyway so um, he sent his stuff from um, uh, from Italy to uh, Holland, uh, his manuscripts. Unfortunately, the manuscripts were intercepted by the rabbinical court in Frankfurt and they confiscated his manuscripts. We don't know what happened to them. Either they buried them or burnt them, but we don't have them now. And, um, and they're gone. Gone. So he comes, he arrives in... Uh, his, his, his teacher, Rabbi Bassan, died. Rabbi Chagiz, who was his main persecutor, became very ill. So there was a quietening of the persecution against Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato. And, in, and in, indeed, he found some level of peace and happiness in Holland. First of all, he found a wife, uh, Italian. 
uh, Tzipora, who was the daughter of, of the rabbi of Mantua, or Mantoba in Italy. Um, and uh, he also became the head of a yeshiva, of a Talmudic academy in, uh, in Amsterdam. And so he was able to teach, and he was able to write, and uh, he was, but unfortunately, that's where he wrote his most famous work, which is Masulat Yesharim, Path of the Just. That was written in Amsterdam while he was there. Unfortunately, as you can see, he wasn't in Amsterdam for long. He's in Amsterdam from 1735 until 1743. And in 1743, just two years after he got married, and just in the same year he became head of the yeshiva, he decided to move to Israel. Why did he decide to move to Israel? Um, most historians believe because the persecution had followed him to Holland. He was not left alone, even in Holland. So he went to Israel. He settled in the north of Israel, but somewhere around in Akko. Um, if you look at the last page, uh, there's the, um, uh, you'll see the uh, synagogue where he prayed, apparently, in Akko. It's known as the Ramchal Synagogue. That's the bottom right-hand corner. And uh, the synagogue in Padua is, the, uh, is that top, top there. Um, anyway, after they arrived in Israel, and... Um, Unfortunately, he and his family all died in a plague only three years after they got to Israel. So at age 39. So a very short... He's buried in Tiberias. You can see his grave uh, on that picture there. Buried in Tiberias right next to the grave of Rabbi Akiva, which is interesting because Rabbi Isaac Luria maintained that the Ramchal was a reincarnation of Rabbi Akiva. And he's buried next to Rabbi Akiva. That's where his grave is. So that's the short, difficult, and tragic life of the Ramchal. You'd think, live it, yes? What you said about Rabbi Akiva, that would be interesting because Rabbi Akiva started studying 40, and so he lived in 39. It is interesting. I don't know if that's, yeah, but that's, it's, that's a, it's a year off, and, but, but okay, whatever. But I mean, they, the, the, uh, that's how the Arizal puts it. But it's interesting. So what happens is, uh, in someone who lived a life like that, you'd imagine they wouldn't be very productive. Right? I would have guessed that maybe he produced one or two books, but, but here you'll see the next two pages are a partial listing of his books. Actually, um, we've got uh, how many pages do you have there? Of, uh, yeah, two pages of books. I don't know if you have the chronological listing. Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I listed them, I listed them chronologically and I listed them by topic. So in terms of topic, in Kabbalah, first of all, he wrote his own version of the Zohar on the book of Ecclesiastes, 3,000 pages. We don't have that. that was his, his students write about this. We don't have that. Either that was one of the books that was burnt, buried, or locked away. Maybe someone will be, maybe someone will, you know, doing some archaeology in Italy or Frankfurt will, will find it. Who knows? But that doesn't exist. He wrote Shivim Tikkunim. Fascinating. There is a section of the Zohar which contains 70 different explanations of the first verse of the Torah. It's called Tikkune Zohar. So Ramchal wrote his own version, but it was 70 explanations of the last verse of the Torah uh, that we actually have. That we have. He wrote a second Zohar, no longer exists, um, Klalot Ha'ilan, and, the, uh, uh, and here I should point out one of the one of the most um, unique features of Ramchal. Although he was teaching Kabbalah mysticism, he did it in a very logical, orderly, organized fashion. He teaches you the principles. And then from these principles, he shows you the logical derivation of this principle. And he says, and, and basically, it's, it's a type of a way that, that makes it accessible. This is one of the reasons he was persecuted, because he made it so accessible. Anyone intelligent, if you can read through, work through his works, his writings, you'll see what are the foundations of Kabbalah, what are the principles, and you'll be able to understand a huge amount from the way he does it. Very orderly, very logical. He was a master of, of, uh, of uh, explaining things. Just, uh, had, he had a mastery of language. He was able to explain things in a way that you could immediately understand them. And, and you'll see that his works on Kabbalah, I mean, just, I'm not going to read you every single one of them, but um, one of the most famous, two of the most famous, we have uh, 
One's called Adir Bamarom, which is a commentary on the deepest section of the Zohar. And another one is called Pitchei Chochma Vadat. He's got, oh, sorry, Kalach Pitchei Chochma, 138 openings of wisdom. He has one, he basically, it's, it's really a summary of the Kabbalah, of the Kabbalistic understanding of Isaac Luria in 138 paragraphs. Right. So, it's a summary. I mean, you understand that how many books have been written on Kabbalah is beyond, I mean, I'm sure if we would guess, most of you would probably guess much less than there actually are. There are thousands and thousands of books of Kabbalah. But this is considered to be the ultimate condensation of Kabbalistic wisdom. 138. Pitchei, Kalach Pitchei Chochmah. And, um, that were not, quite a few of his works are written in the form of dialogue or debate. He's got a work, Dat not, which is actually dialogue between the soul and the intellect. Fascinating. So it's the soul and the intellect, the spiritual and the rational side of the human being are having a discussion. The entire book, discussion between the soul and the intellect. He's got another book where he's got a discussion between a choker and a mukubal. Choker means a researcher very much like a philosopher or a scientist, and a mukubal is a Kabbalist. So the dialogue format was something which he utilized a lot. He has books of philosophy, Derech Hashem, The Way of God. By the way, many of his books translated into English. The Way of God has been translated into English. Uh, excellent translations exist. The Way of God, fundamentals of the Jewish faith from, he starts with, let's say, four or five axioms, and from those axioms he develops all of Judaism. Which is not bad. It's quite an interesting way to teach. You present these axioms, explain the axioms, and then from those axioms you see how all of Judaism uh, develops. He has got tremendous amount of writing. Mesilat Yesharim is probably his most famous book. Mesilat Yesharim is is studied in, in virtually all yeshivas as a work of ethical and personality improvement. And it goes in the step-by-step development, starting from care, being careful not to transgress, and it ends up, if you follow the plan, it ends up with Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration. He says it's accessible. It's just the person has to work on things. And he says life is about making progress and working on things in a, in a, in a progression, in an order. It's called Mesilat Yesharim, means the path of the just. Yashar is someone, what's yashar mean? Means straight. So a person who knows where he's going in life, you have a straight, you walk straight towards it, that's what his path of the just ultimately is. It's how to get from being a regular person to being a super person. And to follow that path. It's now, I should point out, although in the yeshiva world, the Masilat Yashim path of the just is studied as a work of ethics, the truth is it's also a work of Kabbalah. It's just, it's not obvious. If you'd read it, you could read through it and not understand any Kabbalah from it whatsoever. But there are commentaries on it that based on the, the Gaon of Vilna, by the way. Gaon of Vilna, who's probably one of the greatest of, uh, of the, the, he's called the genius, the Gaon, the genius. Everyone calls him that. He did not waste a moment. He did not waste, he was taught, when he first saw the Salat Yisharim, uh, the path of the just of Ramchal, he made two comments. He said, number one, had I been alive, when he was alive, I would have walked on foot from Vilna to Italy just to see him. The God of Vilna was a man who slept very little, who did not waste a moment, who studied Torah. He said, I would have walked on foot to see the Ramchal. Number, number two, he says, I've gone through the first half of Masai Sharim. I couldn't find one unnecessary word. So, you know, an approbation like that from someone like the Gaon of Vilna tells you the, the, the level of the writings of, of him. And in addition, he wrote, he wrote books about rhetoric, how to speak properly, how to write properly, how to use gr- books of grammar, um, uh, books, of, um, uh, books of logic. He wrote a number of books of logic. He taught you the principles of logic. So that, so that if you understand, he was, this, this, this is something he felt that people were lacking. People were lacking in the principles of things. In other words, there were Jews who were keeping Judaism. And there were Jews who were studying Talmud. But he says, but what, one thing they're missing is they don't know what it's all based on. 
They don't know the roots of everything they're doing. They don't know the, the rules. They don't know the, so he says they're doing things in a haphazard way. They're serving God in a haphazard way. Self-development is haphazard, arbitrary. And, and their understanding of the Torah is, uh, is, is, is haphazard. He says things have to be done in a logical, uh, a logical step-by-step format. And you can understand also, for, a, for Jews who were, who were in a national depression, following Chelmanitsky, Shabtai Tzvi, etc., to have someone who could make the depths of Torah accessible to anyone who is somewhat intelligent, to have someone give you and show you the significance of everything from a Kabbalistic perspective was something uplifting. Uplifting and amazing for people. People were able to... to it, it, was, it was the predecessor, and I should point out, I think he was the predecessor of Hasidism. Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov was born around the same time. Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was born around the same time as the Ramchal. And a lot of early Hasidic leaders were inspired by the writings of the Ramchal, even though they very rarely, if ever, quote him. However, the ideas that he introduced, the idea that every action is significant, every person is, has infinite value, and every action of that person has infinite possibilities. And the, the inspirational ideas they introduced, and the concept of, 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 of spreading Kabbalah so that people could be inspired by it, those were things which were the meat and potatoes of the Hasidic movement. And so he was a predecessor to that as well. And also, very unique in other ways. First of all, he wrote his own prayers. He wrote, uh, he wrote um, uh, a book... Um, called uh, 515 Prayers. He actually wrote his own version of Psalms. We don't have that. Um, but he wrote that. We do have Tiktut Philot, 515 Prayers that he wrote. Um, he wrote also a play, at least one. He may have written more, but he wrote a play called Marse Shimshon, which is the story of Samson. Um, and it's, uh, it basically is a drama and a play that he felt if this would be performed, people could actually learn about Judaism from a place. I mean, you can understand that a traditional rabbi, 17th, uh, 18th century, here's some guy writing a play, a Kabbalist, a rabbi writing a play. You know, if you imagine, like, if some, some rabbi, you know, I write a Broadway musical to teach people Judaism. Not a bad idea, right? But you can imagine if you could do that. So I think I'd probably... Would, would never be called up to the Torah ever again. You know, my guess is, certainly not in Passaic where I live. So, so, uh, but, but the Ramchal did that. He wrote, he wrote a play uh, to, to teach Judaism. He, was, he understood that you have to use every medium possible. So he's speaking and writing, and well, the only other media they had then was really plays, music, prayers, poetry. He wrote poetry as well. So the utilization, and, and, by, and, and I should point out, this is also something which the Hasidic movement uh, uh, you know, picked up on. I don't know if they got it directly from him, but the idea that you can teach Judaism not just by standing there and giving a form like Litvax, like a, like a non-Hasid. Stand there, give a class, that's Judaism. No, they said, well, there's more to it than that. There's song, and there's, and there's music, and there's meditation, and prayer, and poetry, and even a drama. So the Ramchal was very broad. It's a very classic Italian Jewish way, but very broad in the way that he felt that he could disseminate and teach Torah to people. So that's, and, and, and again, I've listed the works also in chronological order, just to give you an idea of how old he was when he wrote things. I mean, just have a look. Age 16 is when he wrote the play. 17, he writes a book on the art of rhetoric, metaphor and style. At age 20 is when he writes his own original book of Psalms. And, and, and he's already, at the age of 22, he's already written this 3,000-page work on the book of Ecclesiastes. So, so uh, incredible. And, and all of this in the midst of continuous persecution, criticism, excommunications, bans, uh, a confiscation of his works, and so on and so forth. And all of this... Uh, it, it, it just tragic, tragic. I, I don't know what, had he not been persecuted, would he produce more or less? It's a good question. I mentioned last week about the contrast between Italy and Switzerland, right? Uh, Italy with the Medicis and war and plagues and intrigue, and they produced Da Vinci, Michelangelo, uh, Vivaldi, etc., etc. And Switzerland, during the same period, peace and tranquility, they produced cuckoo clocks and chocolate. So, so there's something to be said for adversity. 
uh, Heinrich Hein, I think it was, said, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Heinrich Hein, the great German poet, uh, once put it, he says, without tension, there's no creativity. Without tension, there's no creativity. And, and that's actually, uh, I think, it was William James, uh, the famous psychologist uh, from, from Harvard, he, he put it a little differently. He says, violins do not produce good music unless the strings are stretched. And he says, same is true of the soul. So the Ramchal indeed was stretched. The Ramchal had tension, adversity, and uh, he was also saw that the, the need of the Jewish people for what he was, what he was giving them. And, uh, and he did indeed uh, revolutionize. To this day, his works are studied in uh, uh, yeshivas all over the world. His works are studied by Kabbalists. There are people who, who uh, and, and on many different levels. You can have, let's say, my, my 15-year-old son uh, is studying his work, Mesilat Yishirim, Path of the Just. And, you know, it's, 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 the Hebrew is, is okay, in, easy enough that my son can actually can understand it, can do much of it by himself. Now, I can guarantee you that he's not understanding the Kabbalah in the Mesilat Yishirim. But I also happen to know that my teacher, Moshe Shapiro, um, has taught classes on Mesilat Yisharim, the same book my 15-year-old is working, for, to Kabbalists. So, so, but the Ramchal was able to do that. He was able to write something, Derech Hashem, which is probably one of the most accessible of his works, and it's been translated into English. It's called in English, The Way of God, is his systematic exposition of Judaism from first principles and axioms all the way through to explanations of details of commandments. And that is something which you can also study on many different levels, but it's understandable. If you can't read it like a novel. You have to study it, but it's accessible. We can read it, we can understand it, and, there, and, and his works are studied and accepted. Unfortunately, and this is true of so many people, during their lifetimes, completely criticised, not appreciated. But after he passed away, and it was not, it, and, you know, people didn't realise what they had. I don't know why divine providence uh, has it that way. Uh, you know, there are some people that are just not appreciated when they're alive. They're appreciated when they, at the end of their life or after they died, and, uh, you know, that, that's the Ramchal. The Ramchal was like that. Uh, and uh, the biographical sources, um, much of what I've said has come from a few different sources. First of all, the letter of Rabbi Kutiel Gordon, who was this, this medical student from Poland, who became a student of the Ramchal and who writes a letter uh, and a couple of letters about his teacher, the Ramchal, back to his family in Poland. Uh, a famous eulogy by one of his students, Rabbi Michael Tierney, uh, a testimony um, of Rabbi Yaakov Chazak, and, and, my, and Ramchal also wrote a lot of personal letters, which we have many of his personal letters. And there is a wonderful biography called Or Haganuz, it's only in Hebrew, by uh, one of the great experts on the Ramchal today, Rabbi Mordechai Shuriki. So that is, that's the life and writings of the Ramchal. What I hope to do uh, next week, or maybe I'll start now, hope to do next week is go through um, ideas of the Ramchal. Just how he looked at life, how he looked at the Torah, and we'll see some very unique understandings uh, of the of the Torah, he um, and of, of of the human being. And uh, so we're going to go through those next week, God willing. Is it next week? Next Wednesday night. So next Wednesday night we'll actually be studying some Ramchal. If you get a chance during the week uh, to uh, to get one of his books, get it out of a library or something, read through it. I think it'll be well worthwhile. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's not necessary for next week to do that. We'll give you all the information. But that's what we want to do next week is study. Are there any questions?